This is the Alternative Leader Podcast with Mary Williams, inspiring the leaders of today, getting to the grit and discovering the gold with powerful insights and learnings, helping us to lead with strength, determination, and compassion. Welcome to the Alternative Leader Podcast. This is Mary Williams, the Mind Architect. My guest today is Laura Fackey. She was received an MBE for services to cycling in 2017. She's a triple world champion, plus multiple other awards and medals that I lost count of when I was researching you, Laura. Um, she rides tandem on a bike, and Laura was actually born blind. She shares a hereditary sight condition with her mother and both of her brothers. So it's an amazing feat that you're up and on a bike. Laura trained in physiotherapy and it reminded her how much she has an absolute passion for sport. Um, you've grown up in a very sporting family, which I know we can sort of come back to. So you've grown up around that. And Laura has an amazing quote, which I, I love, her favourite saying, which is, it's okay to fail, but it's not okay to give up, um, which I find actually incredibly inspiring. Um, Laura's gone out through her career in sport, but looking for something on the sidelines, she's actually developed a blog called Blindingly Good Food. Um, which is all about food and how it doesn't matter how it looks, but how it tastes. So I'm completely with you on that, Laura. <laughs> um, and you've studied nutrition, actually, alongside building this as well. And Laura's mission is to inspire others to step out of their comfort zone and to dream big. So, Laura, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but I'm going to ask you to go back to sort of childhood and, and talk us through through growing up blind and, and how that felt. Yeah, so... Um, I was born um, with with the condition I, I've got now, and my mum has that condition. So did my two brothers. They're both older than me. Mm -hmm. So when I was very young, my my whole family were were blind. My dad um, also has a, a different eye condition to to us, but mum and dad met at a blind school because at at the time when they were young, that's all that, you know, that, that was what the done thing was. You, you, if you had a visual impairment, you went to blind school. So you only really interacted with other blind people. Mm -hmm. um, so mom and dad met at school and, and then, um, you know, got married, had my eldest brother. And then a few later, years later had Roy, who's the middle brother. And then, then me. Um, so I didn't really think that we were, different you know I, I it didn't really occur to me for, for quite a while really because I obviously you know I had <laughs> I had two parents I had two brothers I had you know I was surrounded by you know, people who loved me and cared for me and you know the mom dad went to work every day and mom mom stayed at home to look after us until I went off to school and then she got a job and you know it's just it was just a normal family really and um it, it didn't really only, you know, only until when I was sort of reached teenage years and I started to realize just how unique we were really. <laughs> and, um, and my mom, my mom is a, you know, she's, <laughs> it sounds very cliche, but she is one of my biggest role models because she taught me everything I know about how to live with sight loss. Mm. And I'm incredibly lucky that I've had that opportunity. There's a lot of families that, don't have that support you know the mm. first child and my nan so my nan was was suddenly faced with my mom when my mom was born with a child with sight loss and so mm. my nan was fully sighted and it's the first incident of the condition in the family and my right. mom um and my nan could have panicked and she you know she could have gone oh my god what do I do with a child that <laughs> can't see I, you know I don't I don't know how to yeah how to look and, and then the kind of initial and a lot of people's kind of first instinct is to mollycoddle them and wrap them up in cotton wool and mm. oh they you know they can't see how will they do this how will they do that um my nan was just like no and my nan was this little <laughs> she was she was four foot ten was my nan um and she was very small very petite but she was you she was heart of gold love lovely woman but you would not cross her she, she was feisty <laughs> um and she just she was very determined and I think that's where mum kind of got her determination and has passed that on to her, all three of us mm -hmm. 
because we are, you know, and we've had to be because I, I, I don't say this, you know, lightly, but the world is not designed for people that can't see. No. So you do have to develop this resilience and this determination to kind of problem solve and battle, mm. battle against, you know, every, it, it's a lot, you know, things aren't, aren't as easy if you can't see what you're doing, mm. but you just have to get on with it. Mm. Um, so yeah, so my, you know, my family kind of instilled that in me and <laughs> I've, incredibly supportive we're all in you know we're all a very supportive family we look after each other and mm. we also you know if one of us is going through a tough some a difficult time or if we've got an issue I know I could go and ask for some help from mm. them and they can help me to work a, a way around it and I'm very do you, lucky. Do you think that um because I know sort of and, and I've I did actually share with the listeners, but your both your brothers are also into sport, and and the reason that you sort of said that you kind of got stimulated to get into it was finding your mum's running spikes in the back of her wardrobe. Yeah. Do you do you think that the sport itself has helped your family be like that? Do you think that that's key? I think sport is very good for people with a disability because it allows you to compete on a level playing field. Mm. Um, so within normal day-to-day -day life you're not on an equal par with everyone else around you you're at a yeah. slight disadvantage and when it comes to sport you know we compete in categories that are so that I, I only compete against other people who have a visual impairment mm. and 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 that so it, it kind of allows you to be on a level playing field mm. um and maybe, and I think, you know, sport is fantastic for developing self-confidence and, you know, just character building. Mm. And I think, again, I go back to that resilience and that determination mm. and, and they are key kind of characteristics of mm. a successful sports person. So maybe that is that kind of Yes, they kind crossover. of blend together almost. Um, but yeah, um, we, are, we are a very competitive um, <laughs> sort of the the three of a not within there's probably an element me and my middle brother Roy who's he's only three years older than me mm. so we are quite close and we grew up quite close mm. and I think there was a, an element of competition between the two of us <laughs> I think there always is isn't there with siblings yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And when you were growing up, I mean, I know you said, you know, that it took you almost to your teenage years to kind of recognise that there was a difference at all. Did you find lots of sort of prejudice or, or difficulty kind of being out in, in the world being blind? Or, or I you just think always... for me, I, I was lucky that I didn't face it as much as my two older brothers, right. because they like going through school, they obviously went through school before me. Mm. So things were already kind of geared up and clued up for, for, yeah. for when I got there. Um, my eldest brother, Mark, was the first totally blind child to go through mainstream education. Right. And my parents had to fight incredibly hard. Uh, it, it, mm. it, in, it, this is in Liverpool. I don't mm. know across the, mm. the rest of the nation, but Mark was the first VI child in, in Liverpool. Mm. It, was, it was very hard for him especially. Mm. Um, by the time I got, you know, it got to me, they mm. died out a lot of the hiccups. Mm. Um, one of the biggest kind of issues I came across in school was, uh, I love to tell this story, <laughs> um, <laughs> because of being into sport and that, I wanted to do PE, GCSE. Mm. Um, and especially even from the age of 11, I, I had it in my head, I wanted to be a physiotherapist. Right. Um, and I never really changed from that point I, mm. I set my mind to it and that was what I was going to be and sport PE you know it kind of all linked in well with mm. being a physiotherapist mm. um so I, I was determined that you know I that was going to be one of my choices mm. and then the teachers kind of went well hang on <laughs> you know, you're blind how are you going to do GCSE PE you need to be able to play a team sport we can't support you blah 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 and I was like well I can play a team sport we can adapt you know gave them a few different <laughs> solutions and my parents went in and we had some talks and eventually they sort of begrudgingly said oh well okay we'll, we'll mm. do it you know you can do and I was the first student in the, my school to get an A star 
um, I dropped. Brilliant. On the on the on the um, academical side of the PE, I dropped mm. three marks. I got ninety seven percent in the test. Wow. So, and I, I, I that was yeah that was my first kind of real win of mm. I'll show you. Mm. Um, don't tell me that I can't do something just because I can't see. Um, it, it, it's it's hilarious. You're you're reminding me of um, obviously not not a sight issue, but my my daughter is now sixteen. When she was um, eleven, she broke both her arms. Um, she just tripped off the curb and she completely detached her hand one side. So she had a cast from wrist to shoulder on her right arm, and then from uh, wrist to elbow on the other. So she kind of spun and, and managed to break both. And it was it was the the final and of um, year six. So they had sports day. Um, yeah. And the head teacher had said, you know, she can do some little things, you know, but, you know, we don't mind her doing little bits and pieces. And then I was out in the field talking to um, talking to the head and we both just looked up and there was my daughter running full pelt with two broken <laughs> arms doing um, the hurdles. <laughs> and both of us just sort of looked at each other, took a breath and kind of went okay so that's how today is going to go um yeah. you know and it was it was it was that moment of letting your child go and do this thing where they could really fall and hurt themselves although I suppose I didn't let her I continue to let her <laughs> um but it reminds me of that sense of well I'm yeah. just gonna do what I want to do <laughs> yeah um and I've generally kind of adopted that attitude throughout <laughs> life really <laughs> um, but yeah that's amazing. I think the older I've got the more I've become aware that um, of the world not being designed yes. for me um, and there is especially in this kind of technical era as well mm. a lot of where people do videos and graphics and things like that they, yeah. they're not very accessible no. um, but it, it's all part the one thing you learn to do very well when you can't see is problem solve yes um, and there's nothing I love more than a good problem to get stuck into <laughs> If um, just I kind of almost want to pause us for a minute, actually, because you've made such a great point there that actually the world is not set up for people who can't see. So if there were kind of, you know, three key things that that people could do as organisations or, or, you know, just people that, that could help people who have sight issues, what, what would they be? What, 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 you know, when what you're you designing say? something, especially or, or coming up with something, mm. I always think close your eyes and will you still understand it? Yes, very interesting. Because if yeah. you can explain something or describe something without showing, you know, pictures or mm. any visuals, then it it that's one thing that that you know would make help you as well to yeah. understand what you're you're putting forward anyway. Yes. Um, and don't be afraid to ask. Like this mm. is my other big thing. People kind of are scared. To, we're too we're too scared as a nation to offend. Yes, we like, are. People never want to ask at all, mm. and and so they they kind of go around presuming. Mm. And if you if you presume, especially presume stuff that you don't know about, you're not you're never going to quite get it right. Yes. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. That's a, Close your eyes. I never thought about that. That's uh, yeah. I feel like I'm going to go back through all of my material <laughs> I use with clients and my whole website and just go, okay, so if I close my eyes, what happens? That's, yeah. that's and, brilliant. And the other advice. one is, like, don't be afraid to admit that you're stuck or you can't understand, you know, mm. you need help. Um, and that's something, again, being vision impaired, you have to be good, good at is asking for help. Yeah. Like, and, and, and no one likes to admit a weakness mm. today mm. um but actually a week you know w what you're possibly weak in someone else is very strong in yes. and that team working together and and it's far more satisfying when mm. when you achieve something with and that's what i love about being on a tandem mm. there's two of you on the bike and it's like a, it's a puzzle to make sure you, both of you get the best out of yourself you know you get the best out of each other you get the best out of yourselves on the day mm. and if that goes right you've got someone to share that success mm. with and it's mm. it's incredibly powerful and I wanted to talk to you about being on the bike so um I was watching sort of a, a video of you and you've kind of got your head really tucked right down presumably yeah. for sort of aerodynamics but yeah I mean how does it feel I mean I I 
I can't imagine being on a bike and not being able to see <laughs> where I'm going. Um, I and love I it. You, that's, you know, that's a kind of, you know, that's a, a sort of a normal feeling. So my, my, yeah. my children was born with a congenital cataract. So he has okay. almost no sight in his right eye, but obviously does have sight in his left. And yeah. even with him, you know, think, so he's actually, he's doing some painting for me at the moment and it's quite patchy at the edges. He's like, yeah. I just can't see the difference, mum. And he's painting that's the same colour. But um, That's interesting. Um, it's actually, my, that's what my dad's sight condition is, uh, congenital cataracts. Interesting. Um, but his, so he, um, they, they tried to operate to help improve the sight um, when he was very young and the operation went wrong basically, and they ended up shattering the back of the retina in the back of his eye, so he was left with no sight okay. um, in one eye. But yeah, so he, he has... <laughs> That's <laughs> interesting. So we were told, yes, we were told at the time, so he's 25 now, right. <laughs> and um, we were told at the time that the, the surgery was risky because he had such yeah. good sight in his left eye. But there's definitely things that he misses and he can't see 3D and things like that. Yeah. Um, but um, but I, I can't imagine being on a bike at speed <laughs> in a competition with other people herring past you and a, presumably a kind of crowd making a lot of noise. I mean, how is that as a sensory experience? It's, it is an overload. It's, <laughs> it's sort of mass, a massive overload. Um, and I must admit, the, like my first experience in London, my first Paralympic Games back in 2012, um, the first time I went up, to start my ra a race, fortunately it wasn't my main race. Um, I do remember feeling very overwhelmed by the sound. It's like the wall of sound, quite disorientating. Yes. Um, and but I am a I am an, a massive adrenaline junkie, <laughs> um, and I crave that feeling of out of control kind of speed right. that you get. On the back of the tandem, um, and there's nothing, you know. So long as it's a, um, it, a lot of it is massive trust. Yeah. So I have to trust, and I've I've been on bikes with people that I don't trust, and I've been on bikes with people that I have an incredible amount of trust with. Mm. Uh, um, and it's you know it's it massively impacts the level of enjoyment. So if you trust yeah. someone, you can hold a heart. You know, you can just yeah let go and you can commit to like for me I can commit to my job of just mm. pedaling as hard and as mm. hard as possible on, on the tandem mm. um I I thrive off that kind of <laughs> buzz that you do get but I can also appreciate it is very it can be very disorientating yes. if it's not something you enjoy yeah. but I think that's the same for people if you even when you can see if, if that yeah. environment intimidates you then yes it's, you're it's going just to not yeah 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 and so when you're when you're on the bike do you have an awareness because I was looking at your sort of head down tucked in position do you have an awareness of of where you are how many laps you've done how long you've got to go is it just I'm just gonna keep pedaling <laughs> no I do I definitely have an awareness I I try to so I do both track cycling and road cycling right um so on the track when I'm track cycling um I have I, I have two people on the side of the track um, my coach and then a second right. person so the second person counts the laps down for me right. so he reads okay. the lap board and shouts it out as I right. ride past and then my coach gives me my lap splits okay um, and he so I have to kind of it takes a lot of practice because you obviously yes. go very high, at speed to hear the information so we have to kind of come up with a plan and be very specific about what words um, so I, I I might not actually hear what they say, but I mm. kind of know what I'm listening for. Yes. So yeah. it's it makes it easier. Um, on the road, I because each race that I'll do is a different course, so there's a lot more to go, going on on the road. Um, and what I'll try and do is uh, I'll try and learn the course. So I'll get my coach and the girl I ride with, who's the person on the front of the tandem, mm. is called the pilot. Yeah. So between her and my coach, they'll kind of talk me through the course and try and describe what to expect. So I do have some awareness of mm. like, you know, if there's a hill or if we're going left or right or when we'll be going downhill, if there's a speed bump, you know, anything that might kind of, I'll feel through the bike, yes. we, we kind of discuss and come up with a plan. 
and that was something I was going to ask. So, so I'm a very visual person. So I see a lot of pictures. And so if I've driven a route, I can visually remember it. So it, without having sight, when you're, when you're thinking about that route and you're kind of being talked through and you're learning it, how are you storing that information? Is it, are you creating a, a sort of visual or is it a sense? No. How does it work? For me, I think it's, it's all words. I'll just like remember a string of words so like I'll talk I'll remember that sort of talk through yeah. so where people like visualize um and quite a lot we do it in sport you know you visualize your performance mm. um mine will be a monologue in my head of right. right this is what I do now and and then I do this and and I'll, I'll think about how it feels maybe sometimes yeah. or but there's never any visual yeah. kind of but I think that that's me and, and people are very different mm. but it just doesn't have any meaning to me because yes. I, I, I had a little bit of sight when I was very young mm. so I, I could kind of see I used to be able to read large letters if they were written in very thick black yeah. pen um, and I could see like markings on, a, on the playground at school and, right. and things like that um, but they were that was only up until around the age of five or six and at that age you don't really remember very much no so I don't anything that I do kind of seeing my head is very childish and very simplistic right. um and it just doesn't it for now it kind of takes more effort to try and picture something yes than to just accept it yeah. you know that's a word kind of yeah. thing so it's like a, um, word, a word route almost in yeah your mind. and a sort yeah. of and a sort of sensory route of maybe remembering how that might feel yes when you've had there's a lot of feel um and and kind of sensory mm. memories mm. um that's fascinating yeah and, you know I, I love the way that we all view the world so differently anyway but but you're I, read an article a, a really interesting article about how people who were born with visual impairment the area of their brain that um is involved in sight mm. generally gets taken over by other parts of the brain because it's not used so much which is why i think now for me because i've i've not used that area of the brain it, it's kind of been taken over by other things mm. um i don't have the ability to anymore because yeah. I've not got the kind of nerve pathways anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, <laughs> Very um, much is. and do you still work as a, um, a physiotherapist? Do you, do you still no, do I never actually. So I graduated in 2010, but I'd already kind of been accepted onto the program, the cycling right. um, program for British cycling that year so mm. I've just I've just naturally kind of gone into sport and stayed in sport and I'm I'm funded by the National Lottery through right. UK Sport right. um, so I'm very lucky in that you know my job is also my passion mm. of riding in a bike and you know, <laughs> there are days where I, I'll, I'll be like you know oh, I really don't want to train but then yeah. you kind of think well actually I'm you know I am paid to do this so my job that's what I do <laughs> yeah and then there's days where you're like I'm out on a training camp in Mallorca and the sun's out and I'm, mm. and I'm like, I have to pitch myself do I really get paid to do this oh that's <laughs> lovely amazing and do you um you know I know so many people who sort of ask where their career is their passion um who find it really hard to switch off so do you have a problem switching off I mean I know you started the blog Sort of I think I used to, and that wasn't very good for me because mm. I, I, especially when things don't, it's fine when things are going well, mm. you know, if you, but when, when you're struggling or you go through a bad patch or whatever and you can't switch off, yeah, then it's like a downward spiral and you get yourself a bit stuck. Mm. Um, so I, but now, you know, I've discovered my sort of the nutrition side and, yeah. and I love my love for cooking and <laughs> food in general um and so that kind of because you know we eat three times a day and I get to cook three times a day and mm. and that that's a really nice kind of distraction and um and I'm you know I, I set yeah my my food blog to kind of encourage other people to be as passionate about food and mm. and kind of open it up to people because I think sometimes especially 
kind of good food people think oh it needs to look good or oh, <laughs> I can't cook because it always looks a mess and, yeah and, it, and actually that's you know it it doesn't really matter no. um food is kind of or my cooking anyways is just me expressing myself and, yeah um it's really funny because so when I with with sports and training and everything I'm very regimented and I'm very strict and uh, <laughs> I, you know I'm, I'm I'm quite neurotic actually and t- at times like if, <laughs> if I don't do something just how it's programmed then I get really stressed and I mm. get um and then there's something that happens in my head that when I start cooking, can I follow a recipe? Can I stick to a plan? I just cannot. I can't, you know, and that's why I can't bake because baking is, is much more of a science and you have to be a lot more exact. But I just can't do it. Like, I just, I just can't for some reason. I cannot stick to a recipe. I just like, to, well, what if I put this in and why don't I use a little bit more of that? And, you know, and it's really my creative side being able to shine through. Um, it's funny because you're completely the reverse to me so so I, <laughs> my mum wasn't an amazing mum and um, so she didn't cook and so I grew up not <laughs> cooking um, and I love food I mean I'm, I'm mm. such a foodie um, but I'm very much recipe orientated so in my sort of 20s it was kind of if I haven't got that you know pinch of this I was like oh it's ruined um, and, I've, and I've had to learn you know obviously cooking for so many children over the years I've had yeah. to learn to be more relaxed around. so I'm more relaxed but I still do really like to follow a recipe and and yet my sister is a very much let's just chuck this all in a pan and it'll be great but I yeah. am so when I chuck stuff in a pan it, it's not good <laughs> when I looked at your blog, it looked brilliant because it was just that sense of yeah just be a bit more carefree with it and you know do what you want and it, it I really liked it because so many blogs you look at it it's quite it's quite structured and also they're often using ingredients that we don't naturally you know have around yeah and I loved that it was just really chilled out that's that's my biggest thing is especially so for me it's not so easy to just go to the shops every day and buy ingredients that you need um so i i do all my um shop grocery shopping online Mm -hmm. and i do a weekly shop so each week i'll sit down and i'll plan what i'm going to cook for the next week so i make sure i have everything i i need you know Mm -hmm. in in to come that week um so it is you know it is quite planned out and and that but you do have to kind of accept sometimes you won't get the ingredients you (laughs) you know you you want or yeah um and you know it it, it, it's part of the fun of it really the explore exploration of food and and i think for me i love flavors i love trying different flavors yes me too um so when i like i love to travel to you know and go to different places so we can sample food from different cuisine and um what's your favorite food i really struggle with this one (laughs) i really really struggle i love to cook indian food Mm -hmm. and and that because i love the smells of the different spices and 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 everything else it's a very sensory kind of cuisine um Italian food is like a hug in a bowl it's it's what you get if you want comfort I always go for Italian I love that Um, hug in a bowl (laughs) yeah Uh, but yeah to cook you know I do I do love Indian kind of different all the different smells sort of signature dish that you do for people Um, possibly so Neil um my husband's favorite meal is that I cook is called chicken creole which is um it's like chicken you, you cook first you cook the cook the rice in coconut milk mm. and then the chicken is simmered with pineapple and banana and chili oh, so it's wow. quite sweet but spicy at the same time um and that's that's possibly one of my kind of it's the first recipe I kind of I made myself from scratch right um that sounds but, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like to cook curries. Um, again, I, I like, but I also, and I know it splits a crowd very much. But I love to put fruit in food in my yes. savory. I have a very sweet tooth. Um, 
<laughs> me too. But, so I, I love to add things like pineapple into curries or mango. I just mm. I make a really nice chicken and mango stir fry. Love it. Um, are these, I, these, again, are these on your blog? Because I'm thinking, yeah, oh, these sound yeah. really nice. <laughs> yeah, they are. Um, Brilliant. And um, talking of Neil, I noticed on your blog it's that you, he's banned you from using a blowtorch. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, I, to be honest, I think that's fair because we should. <laughs> I'm, I am quite clumsy at the moment. I, I, I'll try and blame it on the fact that I can't see. But it, it's not, you know, I am naturally yeah. quite a... Um, I'm also incredibly messy and people think it's really because <laughs> they think people kind of assume that if you can't see it, you're going to be very strict and regiment everything yeah. goes in the right place and if you went downstairs and looked in my quick kitchen cupboards it's like honestly it's just chaos <laughs> but I know where everything is yeah but no one else you know there's, else there's no does. order to it <laughs> um but yeah, I'm, I'm not a tidy person and people like when, when we go away on training camps and that with the squad and um, people come into my room and they're like, how do you cope? How do you find things? You're so messy. And, but I know where they are because I, I put them is. there. <laughs> I'm just not a tidy person. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. So um, Laura, tell me about the it's okay um, to fail, but it's not okay to give up. How, how did that come about? So my first Paralympic Games <clears throat> back in London, 2012. Um, I, you know, the reason I got into cycling is because I wanted to go to L London Paralympics. Mm. Um, and I had this dream of becoming Paralympic champion in my home, own, you know, own country, hometown, sort of, while all my family and friends and everyone was supporting and it was going to be, it was going to be magical. Mm. Um, and we got, I, I got to London, I got selected and I was there and the first two events I got a fourth place just off the podium, which is, I, it's the worst place to finish in sport mm. because you're so close, yet yeah. you've just got nothing to show for it. Um, and then, so, but that was all right because it was the track and I've, I've always, as much as I'm, I'm okay at the track, in fact, I should I, I am actually Paralymp reigning Paralympic champion on the track now, <laughs> but I, I love the road. The road is what drew me into cycling. I love being outside and, and, and that. And so when we went to the road cycling was the second kind of last two events. Mm. And time trialing has always been my kind of thing. It's, it's basically you against the clock. It's the fastest person wins. They kind of call it the race of truth. So mm. you, you can't hide. You just have to all out big effort. Mm. Um, so we, me and the girl I was riding with, Fiona, at the time, um, we started first, it was three laps of the course. It was about, I can't remember the, the actual race distance. Mm. But, um, first lap we came round and we could hear everyone scream, scream and shout and we knew we were in the lead. And I was mm -hmm. like, yes, yes, you know, this is going to happen. This is actually going to happen. Um, second lap came round and we still were in the lead. In fact, we, we pulled even more time out over everyone. And um, you, you know, I even I remember thinking, this is this is the best feeling ever. This is amazing. We turned a corner and the chain the chain snapped on the oh. or jammed on the bike, and we had to stop. And we had to climb off the bike and you know wait for someone to come and fix it and watch everyone our competitors mm -hmm. go past and watch that gold medal that dream mm -hmm. disappear. Um, and of course. So we got, we finished, we did finish, we finished seventh or eighth, I can't really remember which. Um, and I climbed off the bike, I sat on the floor and I <laughs> yeah. broke my heart out because that was, for me, that was all I had imagined and dreamed and that was that gone. Mm. Um, and I, I felt really embarrassed mm. that I, because I, to me, I'd failed, I'd, mm. I'd not achieved what I set out to do and I'd failed and I'd let you know at that point it felt like I'd let myself down I'd let my yeah. family down because they'd yeah. seen me fail and I'd, the whole country had seen me fail and I'd mm. let them down and I didn't really know what to do with myself mm. um and I, I kind of I said in fact I probably I think I remember saying you know don't ever let me get on a bike again mm. I, I never want to do this again um and then you know 
thankfully a lot of people supported me and, and kind of helped me through it mm. and made me realize that no I hadn't failed um and to try you know mm. just just try again and so I did and a year later I became world type uh, world champion for the first time in the same event <laughs> in the time trial right um and that you know that kind of taught me a lot of about like dealing with failure and that it it's not something to be embarrassed about mm. Mm. because there's there's so much I learned from although it was a horrible experience yeah. and you know yes if we hadn't have had the mechanical we probably yeah. would have won yeah. um, but I wouldn't have learned the lessons I did about myself mm. and I wouldn't um, then when I became Paralympic champion four years later in, in, the, mm. in the pursuit that meant a hell of a lot more yeah. to me because I I'd had to really work hard for it and I'd had to pick myself up and I'd had to several times pick myself up kind of thing and and so it is about that kind of not not giving up because you don't achieve it the first time yeah um and, and being resilient and and learning you only ever really learn from your mistakes yeah you you might be able to say oh yes i've done that you know yes it was good but I, and we do i do it all the time i'm terribly crit critical of myself <laughs> so even when i've won a race i'll sit there and i'll say oh i could have done that better and i should have done that better but it's it's easy to say that yeah but you only really act and and make sure things happen if you've experienced it going wrong yes absolutely um, i agree that's that's amazing I, I mean I think also for the frustration of it not being anything that you did just the the chain snapping yeah. it, it has nothing it's to bike do with it it is it's very frustrating in that it's bike racing and and mm. you know sometimes um yeah. things happen that are out of your control yeah. um but yeah that's, yeah, that's incredible Okay, Laura, that's really fascinating. And um, yeah, I find, you know, you've been through so many challenges, not only just sort of around sight, but that, you know, the challenges that sport itself brings. And, you know, just the, the challenges of setting up a blog and cooking. And there's, there's so many things that you've done. You're, you're incredibly inspiring, <laughs> you know. <when> <laughs> Thank thinking. you. And, and, you know, you said you want to inspire others to step out of their comfort zone. Um, just sort of you know before we sort of wrap up what why do you want to inspire others why is that important to you I think I I like to see other people achieving their potential and mm. I think because because I've had to work hard to to do it and and that I think uh, you know I like to see other people achieving their dreams because it's mm. it's very satisfying for, especially if I feel like I I've helped them I mm. find it very satisfying because you're helping others and that's, that's something I, I very much enjoy and I think because I've had to receive help from a lot of people um, you know it's it's nice to be able to give back mm. and I think again going back to cooking mm. it's like why I love to be able to cook for uh, for Neil or for my parents or whatever because I feel like that's my way of Mm. giving back to them for you know the effort they they do to look after me in other ways mm. um so yeah I think it's just it's just immensely satisfying to see other people achieving something and yeah and stepping out of that comfort zone yeah I know um you know when I work with clients often it's around their sort of internal self-worth and their own development and and it is scary, isn't it, to change those things about yourself? Yeah. And and it is a question of you, you have to step out of your comfort zone if you if you want to see change. We don't learn from our comfort zone, and yeah. um, so I agree. It's it's beautiful to watch people make that significant change, but scary when it's you. Yes, very much. So. <laughs> you get you get used to living with that underlying sort of fear at times. Yes, <laughs> but, you do. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's funny, isn't it? I think, you know, at the moment, sort of in this middle of this pandemic, I think a lot of people have had to do that, actually. Step yes. out of their comfort zone and, you know, you just have to get on with it. So I think, yeah. I do feel it's going to help. Obviously, there, you know, people it's had a devastating effect on, but I think for a lot of people, it has really helped them as people grow and they've seen that they yeah. have resilience that they didn't have. I think I've learned a lot about myself in this 
kind of time as well which has been really good it's been a good time mm, I agree and I was sort of saying my two youngest are 14 and 16 and I was sort of saying to them you know this is going to give you so much resilience you know when you're older yeah. and you're in the workplace and people say oh we've got this problem you'll be like this is not a problem I've lived through the pandemic um, and I, you know and I said to them it's funny to think isn't it you know that you'll kind of you know sit with grandchildren or you know nieces and nephews or whatever and, and be able to go oh yeah I was in that you know when you're yeah. older um, yeah. that absolute resilience but I want to want to end with the three key questions that I that I always ask all of my guests um, so going through all the sort of challenges that you've been through in your life have there been sort of books films or pieces of music that, are, that have helped you through that or that are particularly resonate for you um it's, it's a difficult one but the the books and, and that I love music and I listen to music a lot mm -hmm. um through training or I, I always whenever I'm training or, or warming up for a race I, I always have music on um and what I, I generally seem to associate music to different feelings so if I've had a good race I'll generally um listen to the same music I, I listen to in that race for every race because I associate that feeling of of feeling good and strong and happy mm -hmm. with that music Mm. um so I, i'm very much into kind of rock music um <laughs> any particular titles <laughs> um so bands i like are, are bands like shinedown nickelback green day um foo fighters mm -hmm. so i i wouldn't say there's a specific song yeah. um and the same with films um and books i love to read and again I, i've always got a book um on the go in fact i'm currently listening to um one that about it's written by a brain surgeon um he his his kind of life story mm. a neurosurgeon and it's fascinating i find and i find all kind of sort of books about mm. other people you know interesting um but again, it's it's very hard to think of one specific. So the one I'm currently reading is Do No Harm. And I do love the medical, again, I think because I wanted to go into kind of yeah. physiotherapy and, and that. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to hard to come up with a specific one. Uh, film, again. I guess your experience of film is very different. Yeah, I only really started watching films properly when so now you can have yeah, there's a um, audio description option especially on um it's becoming more frequent but like netflix and that mm -hmm. i have i have it quite often now so um i only really started to watch films and, and la enjoy watching films in the past sort of 10 years mm -hmm. um i one one film i watched recently which i I adore and I tell everyone that they should watch is Last Breath, which is a docu film um, about a divers off the coast of Scotland. Um, but again, I, mm. I, my kind of, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't really have anything specific on that. So it's just more music and it, and finding yeah. music sort of inspiring. And it's interesting to me when you say about using the same pieces of music or the same sorts of music from race to race because obviously in my work one of the things you can do um is uh, they call it anchoring um i'm sure yes. you've come across this in sport yes. yeah and it's so in some respects you're naturally doing that aren't you you're yeah. anchoring kind of good feelings from one time to good feelings for another and actually i always think all of us do this we just do it naturally it's that sort of i want to feel a bit up today i'm going to listen to this music or actually i'm in a I'm in a lower mood and I want to listen to this music or relax yeah. that. We do it very naturally. But in sport, um, you know, it's used very actively, isn't it, anchoring to kind of... Yeah, very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you quote kind of, you know, superstitions almost when with sport. And I, I'm terrible. <laughs> like, I have to wear a purple sports bra on, on race day <laughs> or otherwise I will have a bad race. <laughs> I, I have to wear new socks. If I don't have new socks, a packet, you know, and I, I have to open the packet on race day and, you know, go through the whole procedure of taking new socks out of the bag. Um, otherwise, I'll have a bad race. And <laughs> it's, it's just those things that you kind of latch on to and, and, and that it's, 
yeah psychology sports psychology and psychology anyway it's it's fascinating it is that's absolutely incredible that's hilarious (laughs) okay my, my second question to you is is for the for the listeners and watchers today what would be your takeaway something they could either think differently about or something they could actively do today that would help them sort of start to change things in their life um don't be afraid get you know get out don't be afraid to fail like i've said and you know try something different try something new um and learn to live with a little bit of fear like (laughs) fear is not a bad thing Mm. it's it's like so when when you race that feeling of nervousness is it is exact when you when you break it down you've got butterflies in your stomach you, you're a bit sweaty you can't sit still you know you can't settle to anything because you're nervous but when you're excited what's what you know it's exactly the same description butterflies in your stomach can't sit still mm. you, you've got that feeling of ag- agitation but then it's just how you interpret it so mm. learn to kind of make that mental switch of I'm not nervous I'm just excited Mm. It, that's a fantastic piece of advice because I'm not sure if you're aware, but actually they they realised when they scanned people's brains that the brain can't tell the difference. Yeah. And and yeah. so it was. It's completely the context that we give it. And I I know I was working with a really lovely young lad who was about 22, and he had to give a sort of an exam presentation, and he had the same. He had such anxiety. That's why he came to see me, and we just turned it around, and he'd start yeah. saying, "Yeah, I'm in the zone. You know, I'm ready to present." And it was, as you say, all the same feelings, and it's just the context that we think about it. Yeah. So um, that's brilliant. And so my third question to you is, if you were standing in front of kind of world leaders today, what would be the message that you'd want to give them? Um, to close their eyes for yeah. a day. I'd love, I'd love for people to have to experience what it's like, because I think they would change, it would change so many people. And they'd stop worrying so much about a lot of things, I think. If, mm-hmm. if you take away the fact that you can't see for a day, and it even strips it back to being very topical, um, you know, like Black Lives Matter and things like that at the moment. Yeah. When when you can't see, you don't know what other people's colour of their skin is. You don't know what they look like or mm. you, you just treat everyone the same. Mm. And I think we could we could learn a lot from that. Yeah, that's a, that's actually incredible. Yeah, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, Laura, thank you so much. We've talked for ages. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks I so can much. Talk for England. Exactly. It's, been, it's, been, it's another medal there, isn't there? Really? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> So thank you uh, so much for being my guest. Not at all. I not really at all. love thank it. You for having me. I'm definitely going to go look up those recipes on your blog. Oh yeah. Um, if you, if there's anything you you ever need in and and you know in the future, then drop yeah. me a message. Well, thank thank yeah. you very much, and I'm sure no worries. So many people are going to find it inspiring. So thank you very much for being on. Thank you. No problem. Bye. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Williams, as you know, and thank you so much for listening to the Alternative Leader podcast. I search for guests to bring you lessons and learnings that can help move you forward in your life, help you achieve the success that you want to in whatever way that shows up for you, to help you lead powerfully, whether that's in your own life, as your parenting, your personal or your professional, and make you the best that you can be. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and review it and please share it with as many people as you think also want to move forward and gain success in their lives. If you want to find out more about me, go over to my website, which is www.mary-williams.com. That's www.mary, which is M-A-R-I hyphen williams.com. And you'll find links to all of my social media profiles there. There's also a Facebook community that you can join. And again, all the links will be on the website too. I hope you have an absolutely fantastic day. And thank you so much for listening.